Hello everyone, welcome to AS Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in today's video I will be concluding the third chapter of the AS Biology syllabus which is enzymes. So if you haven't watched the previous two videos on enzymes, please make sure you do so and just do a quick catch up before you continue with this one. And for those of you who have just stumbled on this channel, I am posting the AS Biology syllabus using notes from my classroom and posting in chronological order so students are able to follow with ease. So let's speak about enzyme inhibition. In the previous video, I said that enzymes are specific to the substrates that are catalyzed and that enables them to work solely on that specific substrate. And we saw that when we were looking at the mechanisms through which enzymes operate, which is the lock and key mechanism, as well as the induced fit mechanism. So even though some enzymes are use the induced fit mechanism, the point is that they still try to achieve specificity as much as possible. But despite this, enzymes can be inhibited and this inhibition can either be competitive or it can be non-competitive. So let's look at competitive inhibition. If you look at the image that has been posted here, you can see that the purple cylinder is the enzyme and you have a blue molecule called a competitive inhibitor. And on the next image, on the next, um, the right side rather, you can see that there's also a substrate. In competitive inhibition, you simply have a molecule that has the exact same shape as the substrate and is able to fit into the active site of the enzyme. So what then happens is that the inhibitor binds to the enzyme and prevents the substrate from binding. This will obviously affect reactions because in inhibition, it means that there will be no product that is formed because the inhibitor, despite having the same shape as the substrate molecule, does not necessarily yield to a product. So that then means that the enzyme is not able to catalyze reactions on the substrate in order to give products. So inhibition is a very, very big problem. You can also have non-competitive inhibition. And non-competitive inhibition simply means that the inhibitor does not bind in the active site of the enzyme. Rather, it binds at a different site called an allosteric site. And when it binds at that site, it changes the shape of the active site of the enzyme and prevents the substrate from being able to bind. So you can see in the image that I have put here that the inhibitor is bound to the enzyme at a different site from the active site. Now, when the substrate comes through, the shape of the active site has changed, which means that the substrate is unable to fit into the active site and therefore there can be no reaction. Non-competitive inhibition can be very lethal in some cases, um, especially if it's in a metabolic reaction. So as much as possible, it is to be avoided. You can also have a useful form of non-competitive inhibition, and this is usually used within our bodies. We call that the end product inhibition. What the end product inhibition simply means is that the enzyme will catalyze reactions as normal on the substrate until the desired amount of end product has been formed. The end product will then bind to the enzyme at an allosteric site, thereby changing its shape and inhibiting it from being able to bind to more substrates to make more products. And this this is reversible because what happens is that once the products are being used up by the body and there is need for more product, the product that is bound by the allosteric site will simply remove itself and substrates can then bind again to make more products. So that is reversible non-competitive inhibition, but sometimes you can have irreversible non-competitive inhibition, which is very, very lethal. The difference between non-competitive and competitive inhibition is that with competitive inhibition, if you increase the substrate concentration, you are likely to increase the product formation or the rate of reaction. This is simply because the more substrate there is in the solution, the more likely the enzyme will bind to a substrate as opposed to a competitive inhibitor. With a non-competitive inhibitor, on the other hand, it doesn't matter how much you increase the substrate concentration. If the active site of the enzyme has been changed, no substrate will be able to bind, so that means you will not be able to form any products. These are the graphs that show you the different types of um, inhibition. You can see with, a, with no inhibitor on the purple graph, um, you can just see that things seem to go on smoothly. With a competitive inhibitor, as you increase substrate concentration on the x-axis, you see that the rate of reaction still increases simply because you're increasing substrate concentration. However, the initial rate of reaction is less than when there is no inhibitor. And when you have a non-competitive inhibitor, you can see that the substrate concentration increases does not necessarily affect how the graph plateaus with time. 
The last thing I want to speak to you about is something called immobilization. And I hope you get to do this in your classroom as a lab experiment where you can suspend an enzyme within what we call alginate beads. Because enzymes are used in industrial processes, so for example, if you go to a beer making facility, you would find that they use a lot of enzymes in order to um, break down the sugars and then to make beer and to add the hops and make sure that the beer is the perfect taste. Enzymes are expensive and companies don't want to purchase them for every single reaction they have to do. So what you can do in that case is immobilize enzymes in what we call alginate beads. Some of the advantages of immobilization include recovery of the enzyme. So if you're running the big industrial process, for example, you want to make sure that your enzyme can be recovered at the end of the reaction. This means then that you don't have to spend a lot of money trying to buy more enzymes because you can simply recover your enzymes as beads or as whatever means that you have immobilized them. It also allows reuse of the enzyme. Again, remember from the previous videos that enzymes don't break down when the reaction is completed. They stay as they are and they bind to more substrate. So if you're able to recover the enzyme, then you're definitely able to reuse the enzyme. Immobilization also ensures that the product is not contaminated with enzyme. So if you're making beer in a big facility, for example, um, it is very difficult for you to start to get through the beer in order to separate the products from the um, from the enzyme itself. But if it's immobilized, then that's something that's very easy to do. Immobilized enzymes are also very tolerant of changes in environmental conditions. So changes in temperature and pH are less likely to affect these enzymes because again, they are immobilized within an alginate bead that protects them and that prevents prevents them from denaturing easily. Uh, this is all that I have to share on enzymes. This is the end of the video. Please make sure you watch these revision videos and if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. The next chapter will be chapter 4 which is cell membranes and transport and I hope you are excited to learn more. Until then, have a good time.